Uh, thank you for having me here. I appreciate the, the opportunity to uh, explore some new ideas with you. Um, however, I must warn you, this is a game-free talk. Um, so we'll be talking about formative assessment. This is a fairly large project, and these are my collaborators. Uh, and here's the research problem. Uh, we have been given uh, some successful instruction, but it's paper-based. And it's got some complicated tasks that teachers find very difficult to use for formative assessment. So our task is to develop a system that will allow, allow, do the formative assessment for the teachers, which means then that we also have to have the students working on some kind of media that allows the computer to access their performance. And then we need to evaluate it and see both what the impact is on the classroom processes, also on the teachers and the students. So that's the overall challenge. Um, but I can't tell you the answer yet because we're just starting. This is, uh, we're just nearing the end of the first year of a five-year project, a four-year project, okay? So what I will describe is the problem and then review some existing work that's pertinent on media systems that are used in classrooms, then talk about ours, and then just sort of worry out loud, and hopefully you will help me on this, uh, about the impact on teachers, primarily on teachers, okay? So the classroom challenges are the names that the MAP Center has given to their uh, lessons. Each lesson, there's about 100 of them, addresses a whole bunch of uh, common core state standards of mathematics primarily focusing on the seven practices, which are very difficult in general to assess. Um, these are very widely used, despite the fact there's no publisher, no advertising. In fact, a conference uh, next month in California will have 200 participants who are all users. And this is all by word of mouth. So they're very um, highly regarded lessons. Um, here's one of them, okay. Um, try your hand at this if you have a piece of paper. So if you can do this in your head, great, but most people uh, will need a large piece of paper and quite a bit of time. Um, so uh, a typical classroom challenge uh, <clears throat> like this one <clears throat> starts out with the students working individually on this and they're told, don't worry, you can't possibly do this in 15 minutes, just try it and get started. The teacher will get that, uh, work on it overnight, and then uh, the next day provide a little bit of feedback, and then there'll be a, uh, some uh, group work, and then some more uh, sample solutions of different kinds of mathematical approaches to the problem. And then on the last day, there's a little bit of a uh, try again individually at it, okay? So the teacher's job through this is to understand each paper that they get and mark it up with some advice. Don't tell them the correct solution. There is, in some sense, no correct solution to any of these. They're big, open-ended uh, mathematical explorations. During the small group work, the teachers are supposed to circulate and guide the discussion without telling students the right way to do things and so forth. So it's, it's hard for teachers. And what do I, how hard is it, okay? Well, here's our problem again. This might be something that a teacher would see, okay? Uh, P probably stands for pregnant. Uh, six is probably the number of kittens. Wait means the, the, um, the period after uh, pregnancy that a cat has to wait before they can become pregnant again. So, um, uh, from the teacher's manual, uh, teachers are supposed to ask questions like this. Uh, are you assuming that the original cat is baby? Um, please write your assumptions down. Or will these kittens grow up and have uh, kittens themselves? Or are they all males? Or do they just die after they've been born? Um, so um, here's another thing that could be written down. What would you say? There's a little hint there, if you can read it. OK, so that's a problem. Uh, here's another thing that a kid wrote. Okay, and here's another one. Okay, walk up in five seconds, figure out something really cool to say to the kid to get them involved in the math. Okay, that's hard. Okay, so here's the problem. Um, they have to understand these papers uh, the night before the main lesson, and they don't want to spend all night on this. They have to circulate and understand the, the students' work as the students are working on it. Okay, so how can we help? First of all, how can we even perceive, get a computer to perceive what the students are up to? And then how can we get this to do the computer to help the teachers as they're wandering around with the students? Okay, so now you understand our problems. So let me review some existing work that we've drawn upon in designing this system, okay? Um, well, there's a lot of media systems out there, some of which aren't even thought of as classroom uh, media systems, but they are. Um, 
And they can be basically classified along two dimensions. One dimension is sort of how much assessment is the media system going to do. And uh, the second dimension, independent of that, is how well do they support group work, small group work in the classroom. So it's going to turn out that fact is in the far right uh, lower cell, the worst cell to be in. Um, but I'll go through the others so you can see what sort of some near misses are. Okay, And I kind of think this is an interesting uh, classification system that I haven't seen before. So hopefully uh, you'll see it as something interesting. And um, if there's anybody out there who's interested in starting companies, there's one cell in here which has, actually two cells in here which has no occupants. And I think there's a market. Anyhow. Um, so first, there's a, a lot of classroom, uh, computer classroom management systems out there, okay? And they don't do any assessment at all, and they're not designed for groups. And here's one of them, okay? This is Land School. Um, these, are assigned, these are essentially designed to install underneath the operating system. They allow the, the person, the students, to run anything on their computer. And this, uh, the only thing is now that the teacher can see what they're running. The teacher can also make certain uh, controls on there, like they can't go to certain addresses or they can't run certain apps. And there's a bunch of other things that happen. There's typically a seat map that these icons can be maneuvered. Um, you can pause everybody, cause their whole uh, screen to go blank so that the students have to pay attention to you. Um, and you better remember to unpause them. Um, you can control their access. I mentioned that. Um, you can even turn their computers off remotely. Um, you can take any screen, tap on it a couple times, and cause it to uh, be displayed to, on everybody else's screen. So you can talk about somebody's work. Um, and so forth. There's an electric hand uh, raising facility, and of course, you can send a message to somebody saying, you know, please stop playing. Uh, it looks like a, it's a, a form of poker in the upper left hand side there. Um, so uh, that's a classroom management system. Okay, another media that's getting very popular in universities are clickers, um, but you could also work on worksheets uh, out there. So the basic idea here is the media knows the right answers. And so here's a um, uh, uh, a particular clicker system, Learning Catalytics, which has a seat map capability. Green means correct, um, other colors means incorrect, and you can actually see the response on the seat map. Um, you can hoover your pointer over one of these things and see the actual uh, person's name, a picture of them, and if there's any details that they've entered, because sometimes they have to type in an explanation, then you can see that too. Okay. Um, you could also have um, a plain old worksheet, you know, done electronically, just like the kind of thing that you would have them do for homework, but you could have them do it in class. Um, and if the grade books are updated in real time, like this one is the OLI grade book, uh, it's showing a progress bar, how many people have completed how much. And you can also toggle it so it will show the percent correct, not just completion. So that would be kind of cool. You can imagine um, people now who do a lot of seat work, if the kids did it on a laptop and they just used Pearson's um, homework or something like that, then they could do this in real time. Okay, so that's an example of using short answers. The media system uses, that's the key to making that, all that work, use short answers. Use multiple choice, use numbers, use uh, phrases. Um, now, for very long, complicated things, uh, there's a bunch of systems that essentially can't understand what the people are doing, but they can count how many times you've done it. Um, so, for example, this is a system which is looking at posts to a forum. Okay, there's a little social networking down in the lower left. There's a word cloud up in the top left. Uh, there's pie charts uh, showing the number of contributions by each participant and the length of the, uh, the contributions. And then it's also graphed over time. So there's a lot of these kinds of things too. And there's a lot of systems that, um, besides forums for there's uh, brainstorming systems, there's concept mapping systems. There's a lot of things where the system doesn't understand enough about the task or the student's response to it but it can count how many times a person has responded. Okay. Lastly, we have a huge classification uh, of things that I call step-based uh, tutoring systems or task systems if they don't have any tutoring capability. Now, if these are hooked up to a real-time gradebook, then you've got another thing that you can use in class that goes beyond short answers. Okay, so here's the uh, a physics tutoring system called Andes. Each of those uh, green things there and the one red thing is a separate step. They're typed in by the students. And they can also draw things. And that's a step, too. Okay, So you can look at, this is the grade book uh, for Andes. This is the, the OLI version of it. Um, if you click on those little green things, you actually bring up 
the Andy screen as the person is typing on it. So you can see what they're doing in the middle of class. Um, you can also, if, if they're done with it, it'll bring it up and then you can work with the kid on completing it and answering their questions and stuff. Um, so this is a typical grade book with students on the rows and the columns are, in this case, modules with exercises in them, okay? So you can sort of see how that might be useful in a class situation too. Now moving over to, none of those things know anything about groups, okay? So if you wanna support small group work, which I do, because that's part of what we have to do in our project, then let's look at some uh, systems that do that, okay? So we're gonna look at some systems next which uh, don't understand, they have no assessment capability, but they can count, and they support groups. So this is uh, group scribbles. And the way this works is the students have at the bottom a private area where they can put little post-its and write on them. And then when they've got everything how they like it, they can move them up into the groups area so everybody in the group can see it, okay? And moreover, um, they support something they call a gallery walk where one group can pull down and see the, the public part of another group's board so they can get ideas from it. And, they, and this turns out when they did comparison studies to be much less disruptive than having the group stand up physically and walk over to the other groups, which is what they used to do. Because what happens is, of course, you get classroom management problems and a lot of chit chat and so forth. This keeps kids on task, okay? Uh, and it's one way that you can support students. So in order to make that work, the teacher's dashboard has to be more than a grade sheet, more than a class map. It has to actually have some way of managing the group memberships. Typically, these things also have a way of selecting the activity for the students so that you can gate them through various activities, okay? Um, it doesn't understand what students are doing, but it can count them. So this is uh, a graph over time of the participants of students who are uh, the number of cards essentially they posted. Um, so that gives you an idea. Now, if we move back up here to the sort of uh, uh, classroom management systems, you would think, well, why don't we have some there that can also support groups? Um, well, um, this supports uh, shared screens. Shared screens are all over the place. You've probably used them. Google Docs, are, for example, um, a shared screen type system. Twiddler, which is what you're looking at here, is one. It's a, it's a collaborative whiteboard. But there's also things like TeamViewer, which are where you can not only uh, look at somebody else's screen, but you can actually take over their whole computer with their permission and, and type on it um, and mouse on it. So these things are out there. The sharing's not a problem. The problem is that they don't support groups very well. Um, so that's one commercial opportunity that somebody needs to take care of. Um, another one, which is all those uh, learning analytics, I um, mean, all those uh, clicker type things, there's none that are set up for groups that I know of. Um, uh, there's no way to, for example, uh, take a, a regular old uh, math Excel type uh, homework system and turn it into group based. So everybody works on the same worksheet, but um, you know, three people in a group work on one worksheet, three people in a different group work on a different worksheet. That doesn't exist either. Um, somebody should make Pearson do that. Um, so uh, now let's talk about um, something that does exist. Um, there, but there's only one example of this that I know of. Okay, this is a step-based tutoring system, so to speak. It's very primitive, um, but it's designed for use in a group. Okay, this is called a uh, multi-tablet classroom, uh, done by uh, Martinez Maldando. Maldando. Um, and in this one, uh, you can sort of see the teacher's got a tablet, um, and that's the classroom. Um, there's a bunch of uh, IBM uh, tabletop computers there. Um, and what the teacher is looking at is icons which describe what's going on in each of the little groups. And these are radar diagrams. I think bar charts would be better, but that's just me. Um, they can measure the number of concepts a person's got right because it can understand the concept map that these people are drawing. Understand in the sense that it can uh, count the number of correct concepts and links in the map. It's very simple. Um, so it can graph the number of correct concepts that people in the group have contributed. In this case, um, the person who's designated by the yellow dot seems to have contributed much more concepts than the other person. So it's also displaying a degree of the sort of the evenness or symmetry of collaboration, which is an interesting property. Um, and then down below is just the number of touches, which is another way to uh, measure activity in the group. Okay, so this is an example of a group-based system. And as I mentioned before, our fact system belongs down in the lower right corner. We want something that will be able to assess the student's work, but it supports groups, okay? So that's um, the problem. Now, we don't have the analysis system ready yet, but um, we're working on the media system, and that's what I'd like to just briefly describe to you. Um, 
So here's another problem that the students are working on, that the students can work on. It's a different CC. Every student has a tablet in this setup, and uh, all the students in a group have their tablets pointed at the same underlying worksheet. They can scroll and zoom around it. It's usually quite large. Um, and they can all write on it simultaneously. So these are two students writing at the same time on the same worksheet. Okay. Um, they also have cards, um, four kinds of cards. And they can move these around. They can draw links between them. Um, Let's get this into a little thing, which is if you're going to have support groups, then you have to worry about um, mutual exclusion. So what happens in our system is when a student has started to work on a card, it locks the card. Nobody else can move it or delete it until that student has released it. They can write on it, but they can't delete it. We found that if we didn't do that, a student would be writing on a card, another student would move it. Um, and so the card would move out from underneath the person's pen while they're trying to write on it, and that really irritated them. So um, we, we put in this locking system, okay? Um, now moving to the teacher's dashboard, um, they have a variety of things, but uh, to fit them all on the screen, they have to select which one they want to look at. So if they want to look at the people screen, then they see a, uh, a seat map. That's actually just a set of cards. They can move them to be a seat map or alphabetical or whatever they want. The big cards are groups and little cards are kids. And they can use their fingers to move the kids in and out of the groups very easy, okay? Those three kids over on the side, they're working by themselves. Um, so uh, that's how you create groups, really simple. Um, they can pause everybody's tablet so the students can have to listen to them. Um, they can uh, tap the projector button um, and that causes whatever they're seeing on their tablet to be projected on the data uh, projector or the smart board in the classroom. Um, they also have a way of walking through the lesson plan. So this is the lesson plan from one of the uh, classroom challenges. Each row is a part of the lesson plan, and it's displaying the worksheet that is viewed by the students and gives them some approximate idea of the length of time for this, um, which they may or may not obey. They click on, uh, they tap on a row to go to the next thing. When they do that, um, see, this is one of the design things, and we don't know whether this is going to work or not. Uh, we decided to let students have control over their own tablets, but this teacher can think, uh, the teacher can tell them what thing they should be doing. So this is saying, go to Boomerangs 2. They don't have to do it. So in fact, we felt that was necessary because some of the teachers like students to work either behind or ahead of the rest of the class. So they have to be able to work on different things than the rest of the class. So this is one of those things that we're going to find out when we take it out to the real world, whether that was a good decision. Okay. Now, what about this analysis? Okay. Let's look at seat work. So here's what uh, teachers repeatedly do during uh, seat work, to put it sort of in cartoonish form. Uh, they've checked for raised hands. And then they pick a group or a student that needs some help. And they go uh, look at that student's work and try and understand it. And then they discuss it with the student, hopefully not giving everything away. And then they might consider displaying that work to the whole class. And when they're done with that, they might check whether it's time to stop this activity and go on to the next one. And if not, they do this all over again. OK, so how can we support that? Well, using the current dashboard, we can have the dashboard maintain a queue of raised hands. Uh, we can let people peek at uh, a student work before going over there. That's really easy. Um, we can use some icons like the ones I showed you, which indicate degrees of correctness of prog uh, progress. Uh, we can take a snapshot for display to the whole class later. Um, we can use some indicators to, so the teacher can see how well the whole class is doing, whether it's time for them to go on. Okay, so that we can currently do without any uh, technology that understands what the students are doing. So if we could understand it, what, what could be uh, further value could we add? Well, the main thing would be we'd like to have the system pose questions to the teacher, which when asked to the students would cause their uh, mathematical exploration to be deepened without giving it away or controlling them or somehow uh, taking them down um, a, a too strict path. That's a really tough question. The people at uh, MAP have thought up a lot of such good questions, but it's really hard to get teachers to ask them because there's a lot of them, and they're uh, keyed to very uh, uh, subtle, thank you, uh, subtle patterns. So we'd like the system to do that. But if it can do that, then probably we can have progress indicators that are based not on um, a correctness, but on how many of the learning opportunities out there have they taken advantage of so far. We can have alerts for people who have been stuck on a misconception for a long time. We can have a path planner that says, okay, go to the next three people. They're all close to each other. Um, 
we can have a diagnostic highlighting. So when you look at when you peek at a kid's screen, it might highlight certain parts of it as, as showing something that you should act on. Um, we can use uh, more sophisticated ways of deciding um, stuff like whether to project it to the class or whether you're done. Okay, so these are just a few of the things that are enabled by pairing up assessment technology with real-time teacher dashboards. So. Um, my take-home points are these. Uh, complex, open-ended classroom uh, collaboration is coming. Um, it's always been possible, with paper and pencil and whatnot, uh, but now it's coming on a computer-supported form. But this is going to make uh, teachers' life very hard, and hopefully if we can get this formative assessment stuff going on computers, we can help them. But the key thing is the last point there. Are we going to help them or are we going to hurt them? Because it's like a heads-up display in an aircraft. You've got to get that exactly right or somebody's going to fly their plane into a mountain because they're looking at the heads-up display. So that's the same problem in the classroom. If there, we do not want teachers to wander around with a ta uh, tablet, staring at the tablet instead of interacting with the kids. Okay? Thank you. So I have a little bit of a different perspective. I'm an outsider to education. Um, I have a technology background. And um, I would like to share with you my experiences over the last five years trying to build a product, trying to start a company in education, and would love to hear your questions and comments and advice. Um, so first, a, a little bit more background of exactly what I was doing. So these are the kinds of problems that I was working on for about nine years. Uh, the industry is called computer-aided engineering, and we produce software products that are used by engineers at companies like Toyota, Porsche, Boeing, Tesla. And what do they do with these tools? They create mathematical models of different kinds of machines. You see here cars, but this is also applicable in aerospace, you know, washing machines, disk drives, pretty much anything. So if you think for a second about what it means to be uh, somebody at one of these companies trying to build one of these systems, let's take a car for an example. <clears throat> the old way is to actually build a prototype, drive it, collect data, see how it works, and then think about what you would change, and you change it, um, then you build another prototype or you modify it, and you do those iterations until you get it right. And that's time consuming and um, expensive. Uh, so that's, that's the inefficiency that these computer data engineering tools try to address. Uh, so you, you build a model on the computer, you use physics engines to simulate everything, get the data out, you spend a lot of time fine-tuning your computer model. So what does that mean? Uh, so one of the hardest customers that uh, we were selling to was Toyota over in Japan. And just to give you an example, they would, for, for, uh, before they bought our software, they made us come there every three months. And our challenge was, that for one of their cars, they would have thousands of graphs. So they would actually drive the car on the, on the road and collect data of motions and forces all over the cars and all over the different locations in the car. And you, the, you would get all these thousands of graphs, you know, force versus time, acceleration versus time, displacement versus time. Uh, and, the, so, and then our job would be to, to take their computer models and solve it mathematically and get all the same graphs and make sure they were line on line, thousands and thousands of graphs. And uh, if one of those graphs was a little bit off, 5%, they, they would really uh, make our life very difficult. And so we would have to go back and debug everything. And it, it was a very hard task. But that's what the industry has been doing for many decades, and they're rewarded for it. It's a multi-billion dollar industry creating these software tools. Uh, so here's one example. So this is a simulation of a, a, a old Porsche model doing a lane change. Uh, and all these vectors are forces acting on different parts of the car, right? So if you think about you know, what happens, when I was in high school or, or middle school and I learned about Newton's laws, I had no idea that one day that thing will, that, that piece of knowledge would, would take me here, looking at the whole car. Uh, <clears throat> And of course, um, other than just saving time, the, the huge advantage that comes out of building a computer model and putting all the work into validating it with experiments is that then you can optimize it. 
So now, after you have a good model, you could say, what are the spring stiffnesses and uh, damping coefficients that would give me a ride like this or, or like that? And then you go home and let the computer crunch through it all night, and uh, there's a good chance that you will have a good answer. And to do that in, in the real world would be a lot more expensive. So I was program manager for this product and uh, um, running a lot of different projects. And one of my projects was to get our software used in an engineering classroom at Cornell University, where a friend of mine was faculty. And uh, he was getting all kinds of experiences, some good, some bad, and uh, invited me to attend a workshop. This is a picture of the auditorium. So for two days, I sat with 100, 200 faculty from different engineering colleges from all over the country and some even outside, listening uh, to talks about the challenges and opportunities of integrating simulation software in the engineering cu uh, curriculum. And it was, it was kind of an eye-opening moment for me. Um, the whole conference was organized by somebody who founded uh, one of the leading companies in the field called, uh, the company is called ANSYS, uh, almost a billion dollar revenue already. So what I realized is that um, you know, in not too distant future, kids at every level will be using simulations and games and, and, and manipulating these things and learning that way visually by directly playing with the concepts. And uh, a year uh, or so later, I started Sim Insights to, to build such a platform where uh, anybody, almost anybody, a teacher, a student, could come in and build a simple model, not a complex model like that, but something simple, share with, with other students, other teachers, embed them in assessments, and just all kinds of possibilities. Uh, it would be web-based and so on. So that was sort of the big vision. But what happens when, when you have a big vision and you start a company? <laughs> you don't have any resources. No money, no, pe no people, not even an office. So that, that was where we started, really at uh, zero. And so what, we wanted, what I wanted to do is build uh, kind of like a baby version of that big vision. So a really simple uh, modeling uh, tool where you, all you could do is just have balls uh, flying around and colliding with each other and apply different forces. But then we also needed a way to generate charts out of that. Uh, and we wanted to see if there was a YouTube video of a bouncing ball, could we put that next to that and compare the two? And, and then somebody said, what if I want to write a report? So we put, put the text editor in that you see in the top right corner. So we built all that. And then we said, well, we have to allow a community around it. So we, uh, we, we made it all work in the browser so people could come in and, and log in and create something and share with each other and publish it in a repository so that others could find it. And we had sort of the basics of a platform, uh, a collaborative simulation platform. And then, of course, from there to extend it to other physics domains uh, involved uh, some incremental work. Uh, but the, the, the basics were there. And, and along the way, a uh, few months, uh, uh, after starting the company, I wrote an SBIR and had high hopes, and of course that got rejected. Uh, we were a little um, disappointed by that, but we kept building. And uh, we had some pilots going with some very enthusiastic teachers here in LA and up in Bay Area, and getting great feedback. Uh, the thing about these visionary people is that they're excited about all kinds of new stuff. And so when you're starting a company, if you listen too much to them, <laughs> they, they'll make you put in a lot of features. So this is something that I know looking back. Um, so we, we kept making this thing beautiful and put, you know, let's put this feature in and that feature. And uh, we were really excited about our vision that uh, people can create thousands and thousands of simulations with this and share with, uh, with each other. Uh, uh, um, we made a nice uh, area where you could browse each other's simulations. There was a user portfolio even where you could have uh, your simulations displayed. You could take a textbook problem and build a simulation uh, and publish it against that textbook. And we were hoping that very soon the world will uh, make simulations for all the textbook problems. <laughs> We allow teachers to take some of their simulations and put them in a quiz so that you could ask a question and the student um, would actually play with the simulation and then ask that multiple choice question. So we were having fun building this system. And uh, we had an idea of how people should use it and would use it. You could publish these models. I mean, we thought of a lot of different aspects of it. And we even ported it uh, to the iPad. Everything was done in HTML5. 
Um, and we got some uh, great pilots. So one of the top universities in China, they used it um, in India. And we got good feedback. Also, we learned that we had a lot of bugs. Uh, <laughs> but we were really exciting. There was only one problem. There was no traction. <laughs> And, and you can't continue a company you know, with just a handful of very smart, very forward-thinking people. You have to have all the rest of the people. And it's not like we had no idea about that. I, mean, uh, I did work with, a, I did talk to a lot of people in schools and, and trained some teachers also to use it, but it, it just became clear that this is hard. For a teacher to take an open tool like this and integrate it in the classroom is just not easy. Now, along the way, we were also experimenting with games and reaching out to other companies and uh, research labs at universities and, and uh, offering them our, our services and expertise and we were getting good responses uh, in that area. So slowly we started to shift toward games. And we started building all kinds of games. They were really simple games. They are not fancy games. Um, at all. I mean, they were just basically simulations with nice graphics and some mechanics. Because at this point, we were still trying to repurpose our platform into games. Um, and that put a very severe limit on how game-like these games were. They're really kind of dressed up simulations. And so we tried to, we, we offered those to our customers and we got a lot of constructive criticism. <laughs> And then we improved our games. And they, then they started looking a lot nicer and they had custom made mechanics. Of course, that also made all these games a lot more expensive. I mean, the whole idea of the platform was to give people a really uh, efficient way that thousands and thousands of simulations can be built really fast. And you know, any picture in any book could very quickly become a moving picture or a simulation. Um, but now we were building games and we were still doing it very inexpensively. After we had a good number of them, we put them into an iPad app and put it out there. Um, so what I'll do now is just kind of uh, talk, uh, give you some examples of the games that we built. So this is a game that is currently being used at Texas A&M University in, in an undergraduate uh, engineering program where the kids are learning about force and motion. And uh, their task is to make that red dot uh, track that uh, semicircular path. And the only control they have is, is adjusting the force. So what's unique about this game is that it's such a simple thing, right? You think about it, you, you think in your mind that, yeah, I can make it go around that circle. And a circle is actually, you, you can, most people can get it after five or six tries, not in the first try. Uh, because there is something uh, about how force affects motion, you know, it kind of has memory. So that's the thing that we wanted to teach kids. But what's, what's even more surprising is that even grad students in engineering and professors were struggling with, not this particular semicircle, but another track that I don't have a picture here. And, and not only were they struggling with it, they were also surprised. Why am I struggling with this thing? <laughs> this is supposed to be easy. It's a particle with a force. So there is something there that is, that uh, uh, faculty uh, that I'm working with there, we are, we are intrigued by that is, you know, Something about when I see it and when I interact with it, I think it should be simple because I know all the mechanics, but trying to do it, it it's, it's kind of frustrating how it's harder than it looks. And uh, we are getting some data and we hope to analyze it and uh, find out more about how those students, um, what they learned and so on. The initial feedback from students is that it was very engaging. Some kids played with it for three or four hour, hours. Uh, now here's a, here's a game, here's a project that is by far the most fun. And this is a project we did with Gurley and Aisha and others in Eva's team here at UCLA Crest. Um, this is done as part of DARPA Engage project and you've probably seen it uh, in other presentations or uh, poster session. But the idea was to build a game that would teach physics to kindergarten or first, second, third grade kids. And uh, before this, we, my team, we had, we had worked on high school simulations but nothing below that. So we were a little, um, unsure about taking this on. Um, but there was a couple of other interesting things we experimented with. So let me quickly set this game up. So the, the train has to be moved by the student so they can go out and get the stars. And the controls they have are the arrows. And the arrows are basically part of a, a concept called a free body diagram where uh, you show all the forces acting on a body. Okay, so, so just with that um, controller, uh, 
the concern we had was that you know, this free body diagram is something that we are still teaching kids in undergraduate. You know, using that as a controller for little kids, is it really going to work? Is it going to confuse, confuse them too much? Um, but we put it in and uh, uh, the results have been very encouraging. So it's, it's interesting and, and we, we think that this can be, we should study generalizations of it where we, we make new kinds of controllers that get kids thinking and manipulating these things in interesting ways. Uh, there was a variation of that game which had a social emotional layer around the physics content. So now you have these five characters and they're engaged in some kind of conflict and uh, in order to resolve the conflict, they have to get the train to move. So you, ha you start out at the social emotional layer and then you kind of go into the physics layer where now you have to get the train to move to get that star or transport a teddy bear over to that other kid. So, th so that was the social emotional variation of that game. So it was a lot of fun working on these two games. And then um, we, there's a project that we're working on right now with Qatar Foundation and Texas A&M University in Doha where our goal is to build a video game for surgical suturing. So the picture at the bottom, I couldn't find a better picture. It's, it's, Intel's just come out with a 3D camera. So we hope to use that as an interface uh, with the simulation. So that was uh, my experience over the last five years, how we started building a platform, then we shifted a little bit into games um, and became more of a services organization. Um, and I wanted to close with uh, some perspectives on the situation today um, and connect that to the talks that we have heard. So we heard yesterday from Alan that there is strong demand for games uh, and simulations, and I agree, it's, it's fantastic. It wasn't like that at all five years ago. I often had to expl explain to people why, is, why simulations are valuable. So today we, we have strong demand and that's great. Um, how many people are thinking about starting companies in this area or, or have already started companies? Could you please raise your hands? So quite a few. Uh, so yeah, I would love to talk to you after, the, uh, after this session and, and, and uh, share with you my, any um, experience that might be relevant. Um, I would even say that this is an exploding market. And, and the reason I say that is, is, is that the, you know, last year um, I read that one to two million Android devices are being activated every day. And every device it adds to the market. And I, we work with companies in Silicon Valley and, and, and one of the founders told me that a $40 Android device is the device of the future. Um, and really pushed us to make all our games work on that small screen. Um, so, and, and the other aspect is that because it is one platform all over the world, it, it's just one big unified market in many ways. So there's a huge opportunity there. And then the industry that I come from, computer-aided engineering, it's growing even faster than before. The company, when I left it, uh, it had 100 to $150 million revenue in 2009, and they are projecting one billion in 2020. Um, so I, I think that we have seen the revolution in terms of uh, word processing and PC and those applications, now mobile apps, but there's a huge, um, growth that we, we will see in engineering simulations and, and technologies like that in future. Um, and so it, time is now to um, expose our kids to those kinds of uh, interactions even earlier. I wanted to leave you with some um, uh, questions. So many people said in talks before uh, me is, uh, that building education technology products, games and so on, it's a very multidisciplinary activity and I completely agree. I've seen how I myself have learned so much um, in the last couple of years working with UCLA. And so the question is how can we foster more multidisciplinary collaboration between technologists and simulation people and game people and learning sciences people? Uh, because I feel looking back that if in, in the first six months of my, my starting the company, if I had managed to form relationships with people in learning sciences, my traje trajectory might have been uh, significantly different. This is the second question is about funding models. So on one hand, we have the SBIRs that I have a little bit of experience with. And on the other hand, we have accelerators and incubators and crowdfunding and so on. And um, somebody said uh, fruit flies versus uh, some, something else. So, uh, <laughs> so definitely the, the latter is the fruit fly model. It moves on a much faster pace. And um, it, it's, uh, I would love to hear thoughts from people about, you know, 
could the government funding models learn something from that? Or, um, and then the third point is adoption and revenue models. So we all know that research projects have great results and then they go to the shelf to die. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that's a huge problem, I think. So uh, I, I have some hopes from Alan's uh, spine, as he called it yesterday. If that uh, leads to a better adoption um, or revenue model where, you know, because the market is big, it's a unified global market, even if it's $2 per student lifetime, as he mentioned. I think it can still be um, very encouraging for a lot of people to take their research learnings and, and products and, and plug them to a spine or whatever it ends up being and start generating revenue. Because when a district says to somebody that come to me when you have curriculum from two through eight complete, that's putting a huge damper on innovation because you know, that means huge upfront investment, huge risk, it's hard. So we have to bring down the chunk size in products and in funding and, and, and so on. And uh, maybe there's a lot of inspiration we can take from the App Store. You know, the chunk size is really small, uh, really small. People can build something, trade on it, refine it, make money right away by selling it. Um, so those are just some uh, thoughts that I wanted to leave you with. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present. And I'm happy to answer any questions. OK, thank you very much um, for having me here. Um, again, uh, since I'm from the engineering realm, I uh, also did some room acoustics. And it's always like that as you shout into the forest and you listen what's coming back, I hope uh, it's not going to be too boring. But having said that, basically, it's like I'm looking at things in, in, in the systems uh, context. And uh, um, so for room acoustics, for example, we want to find out the characteristics of a room impulse response or a transfer function to model 3D effects. So what we do, we, again, we, we apply an impulse and we listen what's coming back, okay. And so now coming into the assessment field, I'm, I have been at Crest since uh, 2008, that's almost six years. And it's interesting to see uh, the parallels between engineering and actually trying to measure uh, users abilities and skills and knowledge and I don't want to simplify it too much it's you know I remember when I came to Crest they said it's like oh it's learning like you know have this thing and you have like a funnel and you put in <laughs> you put in the knowledge like this and I got some really bad uh, <laughs> responses to that so I have to you know the whole thing is relative here um, so now but what was interesting now in the work of Crest, uh, I'm into the modeling. I'm trying to see what I'm, you know, what I'm measuring. Something I want to see what model is in, is behind there. And so uh, basically, uh, for example, I can ask you right now, uh, how are you feeling? And so you would hopefully answer me with a sentence or two, right? But I also could ask you, how are you feeling on a Likert scale? Give me a one to five. Now, which answer is going to give me more input? It's probably the textual information. Because what if you give me a five, I say, okay, you're probably feeling pretty well on every dimension of feeling, whatever that is. If it's if you're not hungry, you're not bored, you're you're not tired, so you're perfect, right? But what what if you tell me you're a four out of five or a three? I don't know what's wrong, right? What how can I help that? And if 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 this is going into Again, control theory, I would like to have a cost function, and the cost function is basically the optimum versus your current state, right? So I, know I would like you to be very happy, not hungry, and just, just perfectly fine. And so if I have to remediate or tell, tell you the next step, I would have to look of you know, where, where, where the problem is. And so that goes into my talk, Big Data in Education. Um, I should have specified the title a little bit more clearly because I'm actually going to talk only about textual uh, data, um, which is just a subset of whatever you get, click streams or whatever else. So I, I didn't put that in the title. I also have to mention my uh, colleagues, Deirdre Kerr, uh, who works now as a postdoc at ETS, and Hamid Musavi, who is an engineer at Apple. Um, so now big data in education, again, the text in, in terms of textual information. Um, Gartner Technology Research 2013, and actually also uh, uh, Department of Education, everybody has published uh, you know, 
articles that basically uh, technology is disrupting it disrupting education. Now basically we, we're getting more and more information to all these devices where we collect all that amount of data. So the amount of data is absolute, is, 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 is a lot of data and so what are we going to do with that? Um, now in terms of this talk about, you know, let's say the data is actually textual data and the textual data in, in, in this uh, sense could come from essays, short answers, uh, short answer responses, like Rajesh mentioned, uh, some reports, you have to write up something, what have you understood? You're telling me how you're feeling, right? I have to analyze that. Um, and there's new Common Core State standards in math, in, uh, in English language arts, and then we have the next generation science standards as well. Plus we have all the different frameworks that tell us how to develop assessments uh, and so on. That's my link here. And the focus is basically shifting from multiple choice answers to the short answer responses um, to get a little more deep learning application of knowledge, uh, which reminds you, me a little bit about what you mentioned about Montessori. Um, I don't know how that's going to be implemented in the end, but perhaps playing a game or a simulation might be applying your knowledge as well and kind of, you know. Um, rather than memorization and rote learning, that's the goal. Now the consequences, uh, uh, as we know, uh, we, we require new assessment approaches, um, and there's also trade-off. Um, the the items, if the more naturalistic an item is, right, the more real world, the harder we have actually, the harder it is for us to make sense of it. For example, I was playing a game lately, um, where a similar game that Rajesh just mentioned, uh, where there's so many forces applied that I couldn't see, and I was dragging an arrow around, and then the object moved around, but I couldn't really see all the components and factors that were influencing my object. And as an observer who would have observed me playing this game, I would have, they, he would have never understood what was the problem I had. Did I understand A or not? What about knowledge and skill of B, of C? So, but it was very naturalistic. But in the end, I, I really could not break down the problem into a smaller piece that I could say, oh, okay, the guy or the person has a misunderstanding in exactly this, right? Um, so also, uh, we are focusing now much more on a, about explanations. You have to argue, you have to basically make a point, you have to explain something to somebody else. Um, there is like the MOOCs where people actually can interact. is like mes message boards or discussion forum, fora. And so there's a lot of textual information there. And the biggest one is actually, um, and this is a, a, according to Randy Bennett, who gave a talk at Crest uh, in 2013. Uh, he basically mentioned that 25 million students will have to write at least two essays a year. Uh, and that doesn't even include the short answer responses, uh, constructive responses. So we need some valid, informative automatic assessment scoring um, but if I'm saying scoring um, I'm actually not that in, not that interested in the number as, a, as you just heard at the very beginning right because what's a four out of five what does it mean um, so the problem is um, um, yeah so there's there's definitely problems with automatic scoring sometimes we don't have a, a, an actual goal we don't know what the, the, the answer might be there's more than one solution how do we measure that um, and then there's different domains there's different prompts right uh, there's different answer types um, so there's different factors that influence this automatic uh, scoring we really want to just focus on text here evaluation of text um, now, what, what my biggest, biggest uh, part here is, is basically making sense of, of, of big data. That's actually the last point, uh, point here. Uh, but there's so much textual information also on the web, in books, and any other information resources. So whatever we find out from the educational domain, we can apply that. If we're able to figure out the meaning of text, the holy grail, right? Then we can apply that to, to so many different applications. We can do opinion tracking, we can do whatever. We give the NSA all the, what they want um, so they can analyze our text messages. Um, anyways, so it would be really to be nice to analyze the information more semantically, more semantically than just statistically. Um, so that currently what we have, actually we have uh, all these machine learning algorithms and, and models and they're mainly trained on statistical uh, 
measures such as word choice, uh, text length, and sometimes even punctuation. Uh, there's a whole story behind the punctuation. I don't have the time right now about that one. That's a nice one. Um, resulting models, we can't scale them. We can't scale them, but again, if, if we have a model that needs to be trained, and that is domain dependent, then every time I have a new prompt, I have to retrain my model, right? So what basically, yeah, that's, that's a problem. And then model outcomes are scores, what I just mentioned, these are numbers, and what, what does a number mean? How we address it is basically we're trying, for now we just say there's NICE, there's already the E-Rater of ETS, and there's other systems that can perform uh, you know, pretty well on certain dimensions of a text. They can tell me something about the grammar, perhaps the coherence of the text, and so on. Um, but we would really like to focus on, uh, on content and see if we ask a child a question, and let's say it's not philosophy, um, but something that we expect uh, some content to be in your essay, that we have like a reference text that, sell, that says, hey, this is what we want to see from the student, and this is what we got from the student. How do they compare? What are they missing? Are there any misconceptions? You know, can, something that we can actually graphically perhaps even see. Um, that means we have to provide the computer with a, re with a reference text. Uh, just for every topic, we need one reference text. We don't need a to, to score manually a thousand essays to train a system. Just provide an, a reference text. Um, okay, so how we do it, and again, this is, uh, yeah, you have 20 slides, 18 slides about the rosy life, and then one slide about the problem, and I probably should have 100 slides about problems, but, so this is basically what we have here. We take the text, and we convert it to a graph, um, I don't know which one it is here, red one, okay. Our text is, uh, we convert it to a graph, and the same here we have a reference text. So we have lots of students answering a prompt, that's this one here, and we have one reference text for that topic where the teacher basically says, hey, this is what we would like to hear. Again, it, a philosophy text uh, where the teacher says, please write an essay about what is courage, and the student writes, this is courage, doesn't work, okay? I mean, we would probably, we could use the system as a flag because we could see, oh my God, somebody did really, really badly here, right? And then we can go in and, and, and look at the text. But basically what we have here, we, we're going from a text domain to a graphical domain, okay? It's like taking a Fourier transform, going from a time domain to a frequency domain. And after this, again, it sounds simple, but it's, it's not as simple as I'm showing it here. Uh, we basically do some graph comparisons. Um, once we have the graph, oops, okay, um, so this is basically how our pipeline works. We take the text, we use a parse tree, uh, which is a standard parser currently. Uh, we do some indexing, we find main parts. That's, that's just, this is all described in, in a paper, actually, a crest report. Uh, and so in the end, we go to these graphs and we extract propositions, and propositions are very simple versions of our text graphs. They just say, hey, A goes from, you know, through B to C, for example. Let me show you an example here. So we take an ontology, I'm sorry, this, this slide, I, I'm introducing ontology here. This is like a leftover. I didn't want to mention ontologies, but they have to do something with, with that work. So I take a text, I, I put it through a parser, I get a parse tree. Then I take that parse tree, I use a text uh, domain, uh, I'm using text domain rules, and I'm ba basically extracting from that tree, I'm extracting this, this tree here. So I, for example, I have the ear puts um, through canal, that's, that's one, one thing. Ear, uh, outer is a property of ear. Perhaps somewhere, else, somewhere in the database we have outer ear, so that means we are going to combine those two nodes to outer ear to make one node. So now, next thing is, we are in the graph domain. Now we have, from the text to the graph, that was the, the text domain rules. Now we're going from the graph domain. In the graph domain, we have graph domain rules. And here, look at it. Outer ear is combined, and this whole graph is basically boiled down to those few nodes here. Now, I'm not exactly sure how many rules we have. Uh, it's actually in the paper, and I completely forgot to look it up for today. But I think in total we have about 300 rules, but we probably could reduce them by, not by another, by about half, because some of our, our um, processing is a little bit uh, complicated still. So we have to work on that. Now, okay, so 
what did we actually do with this, right? So we have, what we did, we, we, had, um, we generated rules and algorithms for 55 short essays about the hearing, the human hearing process. And so for that one, we created a reference text, and the reference text basically said stuff that we wanted to hear, right? So this, there's sound or sound waves going through the pinna, the outer ear, hitting the eardrum, you know, exciting the anvil, uh, you know, and so on, right? Middle ear and inner ear, cochlea. So the whole process we described, and the teacher basically, or in that case, uh, that was a study uh, done at Crest, we basically we had, we looked at these propositions that we wanted to find in the text. That was on the hearing essay. So then we took the same rules and we did not change an iota on the rules. We really did not do, we, we just kept them as they were. And we played, applied those rules to a different topic. And this time it was the vision, uh, the human vision, vision system. So light source comes in and so on. How does a human see? And so the answers to, to that, we basically, uh, you know, we provided the reference essays uh, and then the scoring rubrics as well that we say, okay, if you have propositions, you can weigh different things a little more and so certain other things a little less. I can show you later. Um, and then we compared the performance of our rules and we wanted to see, hey, how do, do the rules that have been constructed ge generalize over different topics? Because what we claim or what we actually do, our rules, they are completely grammar-based. And so this is basically, that's our reference essay. You can have a quick look. That's a reference essay for the hearing. This is what we expected them to write or something along these lines. Okay. Um, the next one is much more interesting. This one is the one that we, a nice example of what we got. And as you can see, there is uh, already kind of lots of fun stuff in here. Uh, we can see that the phone goes to the outer ear. Um, what else? Um, yeah, otherwise it's actually pretty well written, I, I would say so, right? But it's a very, you can see how children think. That's actually an interesting part as well. You can really see how they try to take that very theoretical hearing process and, and, and embed it in, their, in, in, in the world, right? They put a phone in there, right? And the phone rings. So it's not just the sound waves go to the outer ear. So you really have something, you can see they want to apply their knowledge. And so this is now, uh, next slide is basically how we compare those pr comparisons. And there's many, many different ways how to do this. This is just one way uh, how we did that. Uh, the green node here, that basically is where we overlap with what the children say. The red nodes are um, concepts or verbs or things that, this, that we expected them to mention, but they did not mention, right? So they didn't mention middle ear here. Uh, by the way, that's the same. This is the graph comparison for one essay, the one I just showed you from before. Uh, and then the gray nodes, and oh, I'm not sure if you can actually see this. This is actually gray here. It, show, it looks like red to me here. Uh, the gray nodes, these were actually concepts which we didn't expect, but the students put in. So for example, the phone ring, that's something that the student added, and we can see what they did. Here is a comparison of the study results. Um, this is the, uh, the, the comparison of, we call it the system SEMScape, um, but this is for, uh, for hearing essays. So we have, here we have the human scores, so we got humans, human, humans actually human raters, uh, scoring essays between uh, one and five, and we have the score that comes out of the system. And we did pretty well. We have a, a, a Pearson correlation of almost 0.8, and we have a quadratic weighted kappa by almost of almost 0.8 as well. As you can see, we agree pretty well, and there's some off-diagonal uh, scores that we actually, you know, ideally we would not have them, but hey, who knows how accurate humans score anyway. So this one was actually, but this was actually only based on content. So sometimes a human being is, is more, I mean, sometimes, many times a human being is much more flexible than you know, a machine because they say, oh yeah, you know, I think he meant that. Yeah, give, let's give him, a, you know, give him the point here. Now this one here is with the same rules. That's the result we got uh, on, the, on, the, on the new topic of the, of the vision essays. And here we got like, you know, almost a 0.7, which is still pretty good. And, uh, and the quadratic weighted, weighted kappa of 0.6. And as you can see, our system continuously kind of scored higher than the human being scored. So I would like to be part of, you know, I would want to be scored with, this, with our system here. Um, 
Um, here we have, for precision extraction, we have a precision of 79% and a recall of 65%. Uh, and that's kind of an interesting part. Um, we tried to see, okay, recall basically means what did our system not extract? Which propositions did our system not extract that we actually should have extracted? And it turns out, um, out of those 35, so, so basically the 35% up to 100% from here, 35% of propositions were not extracted that we should have extracted. Um, and then we had 20% out of those 35, 20% were wrong and missing were 15. And we looked at those, the wrong and the missing ones, we saw that the wrong prepositions were due to incorrect pronoun resolutions. Kids, uh, they use a lot of it. That was one reason. There's many other reasons as well. And then we have missing propositions also. The missing ones, they're usually due to incorrect sentence structures, which brings me to the issues and the possible improvements. Um, Parse tree generation right now, we, a parse tree, a standard parse tree gives us a lot of information and most of the information we actually don't need, so a chunker might actually do the work here. And so right now we're doing actually work on that one. Uh, rule generation is language and language style dependent in its manual, but at least it's not topic dependent. But I would need new rules for a new language or if I wanted to analyze poetry or Twitter data, I probably would have to tweak my rules a little bit. Um, so. There's something else we're using. We actually we haven't implemented it yet, but we uh, have an algorithm that we want to try. It, it uses an, an automatic uh, rule generation strategy. So we don't have to put uh, the rules in um, manually every single rule anymore. Um, graph comparison, that's a, big, that's a big issue, right? You have to store these graphs in a database and then you have to compare them. How do you do it? There's still a lot of work ahead uh, there. Uh, and then ambiguous statements. If the sentence is ambiguous to a human, it's going to be ambiguous to a, to a you know a, a human. Uh, to, to, sorry, sorry, to the computer. Um, my motto is: if a human can do it, I can teach the computer. If I say the computer is dumb, I say no, no, no. It's the human who programmed. The program is dumb. So I really think that if a human can do it, and we figure out why we do it, we can tell the computer. We can teach the computer. Um, Anyways, and then there's some world knowledge ontologies required. Uh, this all comes into the context if I'm talking about the White House and the next sentence I'm talking about, for example, about Obama. Somehow, world knowledge is required and perhaps White House and Obama kind of go together. So like, you know, one lives in, Obama lives in the White House or we know what we're talking about. Um, and then here's some, some takeaway basically. Uh, the good part is uh, we don't need human score training data. Uh, we only need a reference text. And then um, the good thing is also once we have the rules, first we have to get the rules, okay, but once we have them, then they're kind of they're domain and topic independent because they're basically grammar based. Um, and the interesting part is also the content analysis. So we have feedback. We can actually graphically show what's missing or different ways we can basically show what is missing and, and, and what is in addition. Um, yeah, here I'm just basically saying, yeah, we can use it on big, text, big textual data, but again, before we have to do some more engineering. Thank you very much. <laughs>